do so. So, uh, as you know, I'm a family doc. I introduced myself already. But uh, what I want to do is quickly begin by uh, premiering our logo. Okay, it just went up live on our website uh, yesterday, South Suburban Family Medicine, Denver's Diet Doctor. And so there's a lot to a logo. And I think it's really important to promote what it is that you believe in, what you're passionate about, and what you want the community to know about. So. Uh, of course, being in Colorado, I don't know if this um, implies what it is that we do, but we have some happy people. There's a heart, the mountains, and the sun. So I'll take any feedback. We worked uh, a long time on that simple thing. Isn't that crazy? So anyway, uh, I'm sorry if this is a bit scripted, and if you'd like to take me out of my script as we go along, please feel free to do so. So I'm in a bit of a pick on I am so because um, patients seek my advice after starting non-standard diets. The problem is that their previous doctors see changes in the lipid profile that they consider um, problematic. And as a result, they recommend uh, more uh, standard low-fat, uh, low-calorie diets to these patients and or to start cholesterol-lowering medications with the statins. So it's at this point that the patients come running to me because of what I do, wanting me to tell them that they can stay on the non-standard diets and then they can stop their cholesterol medications. So the question is, what am I to do about this? So am I a cholesterol expert? Well, I'm not a lipidologist, I'm not a cardiologist, I'm not a researcher, but I'm a primary care doctor that focuses on nutrition as a tool to treat and prevent chronic disease. And so since cholesterol is intimately tied to nutrition, I'm obviously interested. And I, as I told you before, I've done this for about 25 years, and I'd like to share with, it, with you what I know. So. Um, we're going to hopefully take a, an entertaining look at um, the history and background as it relates to cholesterol and cardiovascular disease. We're going to look at uh, advanced and standard lipid testing, and we're going to look at these non-standard uh, diets. And we call them non-standard because they are whole foods diets. They're generally lower in carbohydrate, higher in natural fat, saturated fat, higher in uh, nutrient density, and higher in food quality. And we'll look at affordable care at the end. So you might be familiar with uh, the historical headlines, and of course, this is Time Magazine from 1984, where it talks about cholesterol and the bad news. And shortly thereafter, in 1986, the uh, NCEP comes up with uh, the War on Cholesterol uh, Initiative. And this initiative reminds me <coughs> of the Cold War. And this is an eerie but beautiful picture of the first experimental underwater nuclear detonation that occurred in the Marshall Islands in 1946. And this really marked the beginning of the Cold War. And lucky for us, you know, the Cold War ended. It kind of ran through the 1990s, and uh, nuclear holocaust never happened. But during the same time period, uh, when we think about the war on cholesterol, it's been an endless battle. And that battle rages on. And perhaps the weapons of choice have changed but the battle has continued. And so, um, again, from a historical perspective, there's kind of two uh, driving factors uh, in this war on cholesterol. And the first, though it's not formatted uh, perfectly, the Mac's too old. <laughs> but anyway, the first, uh, the first uh, aspect of this is the, uh, the diet part, part hypothesis that, of course, made was maybe famous by uh, Ansel Keys in the 1950s. And despite 40, 50, 60 years of research, we haven't been able to show a causal relationship between uh, the consumption of saturated fat in the diet and uh, heart disease. The problem is most uh, mainstream doctors today still believe that there is this causal relationship between the two. And uh, here we are, once again, scientists advanced thinkers, but we often get confused between this, uh, is it an association or is it a causal relationship? And that's the problem. And the second idea is made uh, famous by the pharmaceutical industry, and that is the lipid hypothesis, that if we can artificially lower cholesterol, a risk factor with medication, we're going to reduce the risk of heart disease. And as it turns out, uh, there is an effect. Uh, it's actually much smaller than most primary care doctors uh, would believe that uh, you know medications actually do really uh, very uh, do re reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease, and you put these two 
concepts together, and the message is to lower cholesterol by any means necessary. So we jump to 2015 now, and uh, the message again is that cholesterol is the enemy, and the weapons of choice are statins. And here we have Sanjay Gupta, <coughs> who uh, was reviewing the uh, cholesterol cardiovascular guidelines that came out in 2013. And these guidelines um, represent a conspiracy, I, I mean a collaboration between the very, <laughs> sorry, between these uh, various uh, government and semi-government uh, agencies. But as you can imagine, the, um, the guidelines are controversial for one main reason that it recommends that uh, a greater number of patients would be taking uh, statins in particular to lower uh, cholesterol. But rather than look at the obvious here, uh, you can go through the guidelines. Uh, I'd like to look at the not so obvious. What's interesting on, on this is that I use this for my younger patients because I think it's less likely to suggest that like the 30, you know, because it's not built for 40 up and their risk for is going to be low if they're young. But as you get older, the risk just skyrockets. So then I don't use it as often in older patients. Like with the patients like in the room, if they're 40 and they're worried about their cholesterol, I pull it up and they have a low risk and it's helpful to give them reassurance when they're younger. You know. yeah. Well, I'm going to poke at the guidelines, but believe yeah. me, a lot of work went into it. Yeah. In fact, I, I actually spoke uh, with some of the authors, in particular the one that did the, um, uh, the risk calculator mm -hmm. for primary prevention. And, uh, you know, they worked hard. So um, what's not so, let's talk about the not so obvious. And the first thing is that the uh, absolute risk reduction is really tiny. And so the pharmaceutical industry is guilty of reporting relative risk reductions. And with uh, statins, they'll say, well, you know, your relative risk reduction is 30% if you go on a statin. But when you actually look at the absolute risk reduction uh, for primary prevention, it's only about 1% to 2%. There's a great website called the NNT.org, and I, I, I would have you take a look at it. It's an awesome website, and so when you look at absolute risk reduction, you'd have to put uh, 150 patients on a, a statin for five years to prevent one heart attack. So it's really tiny. For primary. Primary, but secondary, which is what you're, the next point, the, the risk reduction is only like three to five percent. It's still very small, but uh, again, um, in general, uh, pharmaceutical industry, I mean, for, for physicians, we need to look at absolute risk reduction because that's where it's important for the patient as an individual. The risk calculator is flawed. In fact, the um, previous president of the American College of Cardiology had already pointed out that uh, this calculator overestimates risk, and Rick is saying it starts skyrocketing as you get older, okay? Um, the, the panel kind of ignored side effects, such as uh, uh, diabetes, uh, dementia, rhabdo, liver toxicity, and we've seen side effects up upwards of 20% on patients. You all know patients have side effects on statins. And the panel basically said, if you have side effects, tough. We just want to prevent heart attacks. Okay, well, I, they're a cardiologist, but, you know, I think there's a lot of other things to consider. You know, uh, I was at a Mayo Lane National University for meeting a few years ago, and they were talking about statin side effects. Basically, I think they don't believe it saves lives. That's really why they See, this is the mentality. And as you can imagine, the, the, you know, I said that the therapy was controversial, but even before they came out, you know that, you know, they've been pushing to lower and lower cholesterol numbers for years and years, and as primary care docs, we just like kind of scratch our head and say, you know, what, what was going on with all this? You know, so then they made it official. Okay, yeah, your LDL cholesterol should be under 70. And we're like, why? Okay? <laughs> so. Uh, these guidelines, unfortunately, blocking innovation both on uh, the pharmaceutical side and on the nutritional side. And it only leaves us with one therapy. 
to lower cholesterol. You send your patient to a cardiologist, 99% of the time they're going to walk out of the office with a statin, okay? And it leaves us with uh, one question, to statin or not to statin. And as Prince Hamley contemplates, he must be cautious because he knows that his choice could have devastating compli uh, uh, consequences. And so before getting into new theories about cardiovascular disease, let's look at obstacles to change. And the biggest obstacle is ourselves, being human. We're arrogant, we're stubborn, we're unwilling to change, and we're unwilling to admit we're wrong. And then we take a group of like-minded in individuals and we institutional an idea through government and industry, and then they capitalize it both politically and financially, and you can be certain that very little is going to change. And despite um, advances in science and technology, when these groups remain unwilling to change, we have to call it nothing but pure stupidity. So, let's take a minute and look at <laughs> stupidity. So. I'm probably guilty of this myself at one point or another, but uh, there's no other way to define it better than in one of my favorite movies called Idiocracy. I love stupid movies. So Idiocracy tells the story of uh, civilization going in the wrong direction, where there's a dumbing down of society. Now nobody, <laughs> know, yeah, there. Well, nobody knows for sure why this has happened, but maybe it was because everybody's taking statins <laughs> or the low night football. <laughs> They're all good. They're all good. But, yeah. But anyway, here we have our hero, uh, Joe Bowers, who finds himself in the middle of a human hibernation experiment. And he's catapulted 500 years into the future. And here's Joe in front of the presidential cabinet. I see some Saturday Night Live people there. But uh, these people are so stupid that they can't make any decisions. But there's no worry because. Uh, big industry has basically taken over. And we have to thank one of the food industry leaders, Brando, who basically bought the FCC and the FDA so that they could say, do, and sell whatever it is that they wanted. And so as a result, we get the new food pyramid. Okay, and as you can see, we have lots of Brando, which by the way is a sports drink. Uh, we also have many other food groups, including grease, smokes, caffeine, and convenience items. So this all looks all too familiar. And so Brando, the thirst mutilator, comes to replace water virtually everywhere. Yes, water, the basic essential element of life. They even feed the crops with it, thus leading to the great dust ball. And what the stupid people didn't understand is that the precious electrolytes were salts building up in the soil over the decades, called killing the crops. And when Joe found out that they were feeding the crops with a sports drink, he said, if you simply give the plants water, that they would grow. To which the stupid people replied, you mean water like out the toilet? <laughs> Dust Bowl crisis resolved. Now Joe, being the uh, smartest man on the planet, eventually became president. And whether or not he solves the statin and stupidity crisis, you'll have to watch the sequel but it's a clever movie that points out some real issues we face today. So let's wake up and smell the bulletproof coffee <laughs> and realize that cholesterol is essential to life. Uh, it provides a reparative role. Uh, it's a precursor to uh, many other uh, hormonal uh, functions in the body. It's essential to brain function. You basically can't live without it. And when it comes to uh, cardiovascular disease, we kind of think of it as the innocent bystander. There's other factors, namely inflammation and oxidative stress that may play a more significant role. And so we look at atherosclerosis as an inflammatory disease. When you actually look in the plaque, you can see all components of inflammation, such as uh, macrophages, um, um, foam cells, and an autoimmune response. And you think this idea of uh, addressing cardiovascular disease through inflammatory pathways would be something new. But actually, it's been around for quite some time. The problem is we never came up with a drug that directly treats it, the inflammatory components. Now, perhaps statins through the mevalinate and the superoxide dismutase pathway has a little anti-inflammatory effect, but nothing directly. Believe me, if we had a direct drug addressing this, we'd know about it. 
But it turns out back in the 1970s, a uh, pathologist by the name of Russell Ross uh, talked about the response to injury hypothesis for atherosclerosis. I remember learning uh, about this in medical school in the, in the 80s. And uh, the injury was um, to the blood vessel wall. And the cause was multifactorial, so things like smoking, hypertension, diet, insulin resistance, sedentary lifestyle, all these things um, caused the inflammation. And uh, the, re the response was uh, you know, injury and inflammation to the blood vessel wall, which unfortunately changes the quality of uh, the cholesterol molecule. And so um, you have to understand that uh, the cholesterol is there to to provide a reparative role to the damage. And what happens is that we think of the cholesterol molecule as the fireman going to the fire to put out the fire, but unfortunately, the fireman gets consumed by the fire. So I always think about the fact, well, what if one of the firemen is an arsonist? <laughs> but <laughs> maybe he did cause the fire. I don't know. So. Uh, when we're looking at uh, this uh, inflammatory pathway, so um, we have this one lab, the Cleveland Heart Lab, where they have a panel of tests that uh, attempts to measure the progression of this inflammatory response. And there's other labs. There's all kinds of things out here. And I think Jasmine's going to let us know about other testing. There's all kinds of other theories about inflammation. And Bob's going to talk to us uh, later in the week about that as well. But we have uh, measurements such as the uh, F2-isoprostane, OxLDL, HSCRP, myelotroxidase, the plaque test, and then, of course, uh, troponin and uh, CKMB when you, once you've had a heart attack. So we'll talk a little bit about those. Um, just to say quickly that um, Mark Hanna is the uh, doctor from Cleveland Clinic who I've talked to about this. And when you actually look at what is the most significant things, and that's what we'll, we'll look at later, is I tend to look at the myelotroxidase, the LPPLA2, the plaque, and the HSCRP. Mm -hmm. These other ones, and I, I have to say, it's you know this is all new science, so we're not sure what it means. So when we address cardiovascular disease in our office, of course, we're going to do a full evaluation of patients and look at testing. But you know, it starts with a whole foods diet. Okay, so you know we want uh, foods that are. Uh, mm -hmm an anti-inflammatory diet, as it were. So we want to reduce pro processing sugars, um, uh, grains, uh, in, uh, industrial vegetable oils, and we want to teach patients how to eat foods that are you know, whole foods, lower in carbohydrate, higher in natural fats, higher in um, saturated fats, and higher in uh, food quality, nutrient density. So laboratory testing. So uh, there's all kinds of testing, and I like to think about it in terms of these categories, in terms of uh, uh, treating our patients, and uh, we'll get into some of these. But uh, what I just want to mention is the genetic testing, and to understand that um, we're all different, and we absorb cholesterol differently. We clear it from uh, the blood differently, and we produce it differently in the liver, okay? And uh, you have to consider that with each uh, patient. And then in the genetic testing world, uh, there's still the, a lot that is unknown. And uh, I think what is most important is to consider the, the epigenetics or the expression of that gene based on certain lifestyle conditions. And everybody's looking at genetic testing, but uh, I think they're based on standard diets. So we don't know what the genetic markers mean when we're doing whole foods diets. So we have to keep that in mind. And we don't have all the answers. So when we do uh, cholesterol testing, you know, we're really measuring lipoprotein. And it's a shame that the two names have been confused, but it's really lipoprotein that, you know, we're measuring the blood. And traditionally, the standard lipid testing, we measure the three classes in the blue, in the, blue the BLDL, the LDL, and the HDL. And of course, we think about the bad cholesterol and the good cholesterol, and I hate that term because I think cholesterol is a good thing. So perhaps um, there are profiles where we see less favorable numbers or more favorable numbers, or the HDL is associated with uh, less disease, that kind of stuff. And then we go into uh, the advanced testing, where now we can look at the particle size. And of course, we, we, it now seems that uh, large particles seem to be uh, 
more favorable, um, which in, within each subclass, we can look at uh, uh, the proteins, the uh, ApoB100 and the um, ApoA. We can look at uh, LPA, which I like to call LDL with an attitude. And but most importantly is to understand, you know, lipoprotein, the main purpose of lipoprotein is to simply transport fat-soluble substances in a water-based blood system. That's it. And that sounds like a good thing to me. And that's what it's mainly there for. So standard lipid testing, uh, it's been around for a long time. Uh, I think there's three schools of thought, thought in terms of lipid testing. The first school is that standard lipid testing, in, including the Friedwald calculation for um, LDLC, is good. I think it is a great test. It's simple. I do it in the office for $30. There's a second school that says, uh, well, no, no, it doesn't predict risk like uh, as well as uh, uh, advanced the lipid testing. I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, looking at the particle testing, there's the uh, Framingham, uh, uh, gosh, what's this? Data. Oh, thank you. Framingham offspring data that actually may show if you follow LDL that the particle count, not necessarily the size, may predict risk better than measuring LDL. See, but uh, another more simpler test is now looking at non-HDLC, which is actually mainstreams looking at it, which may be a better test than LDL C because LDL C is um, you know calculated, and then you just what's that, Bob? Yeah, right. So non-HDL is pretty good. So these are mainstream numbers, and I put in some uh, of the uh, international metrics for our visitors from Europe <laughs> today. Yeah, and Canada. Sorry about that. Yeah, and so I don't know. These are just the norms, mainstream norms. I don't know if I agree with these numbers. Like I think triglycerides to be under 100. HDL over 50 is good. And then we can do additional tests where we look at ratios. So total cholesterol over HDL. I think the triglyceride over HDL is a great measurement of food quality, quality of cholesterol. It's a simple test. Why even bother with advanced testing? You just look at that ratio. And uh, mainstream doesn't look at it because there's really no drugs that, it, that, that address that one, right? <laughs> I think they tried to come up with an HDL raising one and it killed people. Yeah, so that one didn't, that one didn't work. That was an artificial one. <laughs> way to uh, address HDL. And then it's non-HDL. It's not bad. You, you know, we kind of look at that in our office or the ratio, the ratio should be under 160. And we can't measure lipids in our office without measuring lipid uh, insulin resistance because we think actually when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, the insulin resistance is more tied to cardiovascular risk than the cholesterol is, right? So we measure fasting glucose, hemoglobin A1C. Yeah. yeah, yeah, isn't that on there? Yeah, well, no, but yeah. I just... Oh, yeah, 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 and yes, very much so, right, exactly. I mean, it, you just you just do a simple, simple lipid profile and, you know, look at HDL to triglyceride, and it, it tells you so much information. I tell patients, you know, you want to get a good um, um, impression as to your nutritional uh, diet, you know, what's good, what's good, bad, just look at those ratios right there. Yeah. So um, some typical findings that I'm all, you're all familiar with, we compare low carb, high fat to traditional low fat, low calorie, and um, we see a precipitous drop in triglycerides, uh, a, a rise in HDL, making ratio uh, particle size go up. So that's, that's suggesting a higher quality. And if you look at inflammatory markers, they reduce when you see these, all these ratios, okay? And then LDL can be variable. Okay, sometimes it doesn't change, sometimes it goes down, and then the mainstream will, doctors will be happy. Oh, you know, you put the, your patient on an Atkins diet, and I don't understand, the cholesterol profile got, got better. So that's always a great story. But the problem is, in some people, we get a persistent elevation of the LDL cholesterol. One out of three. Yeah, and Bob is such an example. We, we have special ordered him to come to this conference so we can <laughs> talk about his LDL C concentration. So, um, and then in the low fat, low calorie, what the mainstream doctors like is all the numbers go down, especially the LDL, but then the HDL goes down uh, as well, which is not necessarily a good thing. 
Now, when it comes to cholesterol quality, uh, a low-fat, low-calorie diet doesn't even do anything. In fact, some people argue it actually worsens the quality of cholesterol because you're adding all the industrial vegetable oils, canola, corn, and soy in there. So, you know, I consider this a well-nourished patient. I consider this an undernourished patient, if you want to compare the two. So advanced lipid testing. So there's many labs. Jasmine's going to talk about HDL. I'm going to actually talk about NMR. And I've done all of them. And here's the interesting thing is that you have to understand that um, these labs are, in, are there to sell you technology, just like the pharmaceutical industry is trying to sell you meds. Well, now they're still trying to sell us technology. So you just have to consider that. 15, right? 15 minutes. Oh, gosh. OK. So this is the NMR Liposcience uh, printout. Um, I like the color charts to it. I've tried to simplify it. Uh, basically, what the NMR does is they had introduced measuring uh, the particle counter and the particle concentration, where you know, you're no longer looking at LDL, but you look at the particle concentration and the size of the particles. And so these numbers are based right off the charts. And uh, what you have to understand is when you want an LDLP to be under 1,000, that's like getting your LDL cholesterol under 70. You can lower the better, OK? And they have the yellow red zone. And then you want, uh, small, you want less small particles. Uh, a way that you can also look at the, the ratio of small to large is if you have um, large particles where they'll give you a printout, if it's uh, above 20.6 nanometers, that's large particle. And then uh, I think HDL reports this, but I just do this on my own. I do a simple calculation of small to total, and um, you know they want the ratio. You only want like less than 11% to be small, but I say, well, at least less than 50%. Again, you know, these guidelines are, are comparing it to, you know, LDL cholesterols of under 100 or 70. And then we can do additional testing. So you can do the ApoB, which is the, the protein of, of the, uh, you know, those bad particles. You can look at the LPA, which is the LDL with an attitude. Um, That's the mass, not the part, remember. The mass, yeah, you which, mentioned part. Which is very divergent. Yeah. From the park, so here's the funny thing. There's a lot of confusion out there because, you know, are you talking about the, the count? The, you know, what are you talking about when you look at these numbers? So it's all new science. And then, again, the point, you can actually look at ApoB to um, uh, ApoA ratios, but that's just like uh, th you can just do, do a simple ratio on a, on a standard lipid test and you get the same information. And then the, these are the last three inflammatory markers, so the HSCRP under one. The plaque test is uh, under 200, and uh, it's funny, it actually um, lowered the threshold. You know, they said they went lower and lower, and I kind of said, well, I'm, you, know, you know, two years ago you said, like, you know, this was the upper limit. So they're changing their mind, and then the, and then the cardiac myeloid peroxidase should be under 480. So we'll talk about patients. We're almost at the end. So at the end, this is Lokar Tatsi. So she was diabetic. Uh, she was considering bariatric surgery. Uh, she had done Atkins diet, lost about 20 pounds, and then heard about what I did and came to me. And reluctantly, I put her on a low-carb, high-fat ketogenic diet. And she had thyroid, and she was on medications. And in a relatively short period of time, I think she lost like 80 pounds, and it was still going. And we got her off medications. And she feels great. And as you can imagine, uh, her numbers got better. So uh, I think this is when she had lost the 20 pounds initially. <coughs> and uh, what I tell people to do is I made them red, yellow, green zones. It's a little hard to see the numbers. It might be hard to see the colors. But <laughs> you know, uh, her triglycerides were a little bit up. And I think just the big thing is that her blood sugar was 131, and her A1C was 5.7, those were the big issues there. And then after she lost her 80 pounds, all the numbers go into the green zone. Triglycerides basically drop in half, her HDL goes up, her blood sugar normalizes, and her A1C goes down to 4.8, okay? What was the time frame on for the next one? I think it might be a year or so. She's still losing weight, uh, so she's doing great. Um, then we do the advanced lipid testing, and so, uh, this is, um, I believe I just have after results for the uh, advanced lipids. It would be neat to look, but 
I just didn't have a chance to do all that. And so basically, you know, her numbers are, are good. Uh, I think what's important is just to look at the, the particle size is favorable and less than 50% are large particles. But, you know, some people get concerned here because, you know, well, her LDLP, her particle count or number is, you know, above that enzyme. But again, the ratios look pretty good. Um, April B was good. So LPA, and Bob could talk about this more, but uh, her LPA is high. And so the thing is, LPA is an independent marker of risk. We're not sure what it means. And especially she so on a whole foods diet. So it's just one of these parameters. But uh, I think that's a garbage number. I think you got to get a See? smarter number. See? Yeah, uh, right. My LPA mass was high. And for two decades, I said, oh, shit, I'm starting to mass. I finally get MMR, and it's low. Yeah. It's a huge debate. So you don't like uh, mass? I think it's garbage. Okay. It's, it can I create anxiety, and it's not healthy at all. Uh, so we don't need anxiety. <laughs> we need less of, less of that. And then her inflammatory marker is basically yellow and green zone, so that's pretty good. We look at carotid IMT, and one interesting thing is that our, our, our testing in our office, there's two components where they measure the thickness of the intima, and then this is actually looking for plaque. And uh, when you actually read the literature uh, in looking at intima thickness, so the idea here is that as we age both male and female, that the, the intima thickens, okay? But somebody thought that it might predict cardiovascular risk, okay? And there's a great article in Medscape that says it doesn't, <laughs> okay? I actually think heart calcium scores are not a bad test. Uh, uh, um, you know, it's just I don't have $2 million to buy a CAT scan machine. But uh, so what we do is you'll see, you know, we get variable results. So we have people that have um, uh, their blood vessel age is greater than the chronologic age, and they have no plaque. Or we have people that have a... Uh, uh, a low blood vessel age and they have lots of plaque. So it's just real simply, you can see it doesn't correlate. So what we do is we just look at plaque. And then Dr. Thomas Dayspring will say, well, there's been no studies to show that looking for plaque is a predictor of risk. Okay, but... In the carotid, but not the plaque in the coronary. Coronaries, right. So um, it's, it's a simple non-invasive test. Why are you doing this test? I want to know about plaque, but that's a really good question. Right, so they would never pay for the intimate thickness. They'd never pay for a, ca a heart calcium score. You know, Ivor Cummins is the fat emperor, by the way. Um, he's a great website, and he had a whole thing about um, how we should be doing heart calcium scores everywhere in the world because it's, you know, it's a great predictor. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the heart calcium is not but I think, you know, you can get some idea about plaque burden because this is, this is kind of the end point. Okay, and she had very, this is just threshold plaque here. In theory, the reason to do that is, I mean, if you believe that it actually does hurt the risk, is to follow the two results you're doing locally, okay? And, and intima or plaque? Looking at intima? Both. Yeah. Both. Um, I mean, if you're producing more plaque, that's a sure. problem in theory, right? Sure. Because you're looking at the same thing over and over again. Um, it's sure. also a great motivator to people. And if somebody comes yeah. up with a ton of plaque who's relatively young, even Your calcium score is normal. That's your strength. But if it's abnormal, it's a, your calcium score can actually increase as your plaque stabilizes. And Tom Space Science demonstrates that, that plaque stabilization requires increased calcification. There was an idea. So, yeah. so the plaque stability and the unstable plaque scoring system actually have demonstrated that more calcium you're stable. More calcium, you're stabilizing your plaque. And what about you can't measure soft plaque on a calcium score? No, there, there is that always in spite of this. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's and really the, you can measure uh, soft plaque in the feet. Yeah, yeah, you can. You, you know, can really see plaque. See, you know, yeah. as it progresses. And, and I see that as a cal cal calcified, the, the numbers go down. I mean, the smaller yeah. amount, the actual plaque. Plaque and, size, right. Plaque yeah. size gets smaller, so I and, agree. Yeah. And here's another twist. If you put patients on a statin, the intima thickness goes down. Mm -hmm. So does that mean it's reducing risk? Who knows? 
okay? Because the technologist said. And maybe we just need a minute, right? Like the whole. I don't think we have the answer. Yes, Anne. Yeah, five minutes. Five minutes. It's a good molecule, right? Okay, so Eric, okay, I have an Eric P. Let me, I'm gonna skip Eric P, great guy, but, or Eric W, because we have another, uh, this is where the money is. If you wanna talk about Eric P. Let me see. Yeah, Eric P, great looking guy with his kid. So um, he had, um, what was his story? Uh, some cholesterol issues, he, he was really good. Um, patient, he had gone to a local doctor for years, and uh, actually his cholesterol wasn't very high, but for some reason his doctor was convinced that his LDL cholesterol had to be under 100. So he put him on every medication in the book. He started with azetamide, then he responded, but he got fed up. He said, I don't want to take medicine anymore. So um, he uh, did some reading and he went on a primal diet, and then you'll see what happens to his cholesterol. So before his numbers aren't so bad, um, you know, his HDL could go up a little higher. It's 34 here. Um, his this is, that's like classic. You're, you're like lower HDL, classic. not really terrible LDL. I mean, this is pretty, like I see it a ton of kids. Oh, yeah. Was he overweight? No, he's great. He never had a problem. Okay. Never had a weight Off issue. Right? Yeah, this is, um, I think, uh, this is before he ever started medication. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And so uh, after the primal diet, Okay, first time in his life his LDL skyrocketed. Now Bob is gonna talk, because Bob's very similar, because when we started to email, I thought of um, you know, Eric here. Uh, and uh, so we describe this as a Friedrichsen describes the typing of lipoprotein on centrifugation. And so this is a, we call it type two uh, A or B pattern that you're familiar with. It doesn't necessarily mean there's a genetic component to it. It's just, this was, a, an, it's an observation. And so, but what you see is his triglycerides went down, his HDL went up, his uh, insulin resistance did, his ApoB, okay, well, yeah, that's up because his LDL uh, is up. Was that five or six uh, in gray man? Uh, five. Five, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, and so this is on the primal diet, and you can see his LDLP is sky high, his small LDL uh, number is high, and uh, it's still a large particle, the ratio is less than 40%, 44% is uh, small. The average LDL size isn't as useful as most people think because there's a huge distribution around it and you can be lopsided on one side or the other. For example, my wife has a small LDL particle number of 1,700 as a total LDL particle number of 2,900. Hmm. And her particle size yeah, right. Which just means a small number of her LDLs are very large and blind, but most of her LDLs are very small and dense, and she's, she's yeah. got metabolic disease. Well, let me just, I want to get through this real quick before <coughs> Rick cuts me off. And so, um, you can see his inflammatory markers are all yellow and green. Uh, he has, uh, this is threshold plaque. And so, um, with Eric, the conundrum is, so are we treating um, cholesterol as a... Um, problem of concentration or retreating um, cholesterol as a problem of quality. So, you know, quantity versus quality, and you know, the old school is quantity, the new school is quanti quantity, and we don't have all the answers. We really don't in 2015, so, you know, basically you have to stay tuned, but, you know, we as primal thinking uh, practitioners want to address the food quality and the inflammatory things. And so that's kind of where we direct our patients. And we've even had, I've had a patient that had an LD, uh, a total cholesterol of 510, an LDLC of 410. And he's a, uh, he'd lost weight, he's an avid ath athlete, and he wanted to take azitamide, okay, to lower it. But it's interesting, when you look at the evidence, there's no evidence that azitamide actually reduces cardiovascular risk. <laughs> Lowers cholesterol, well, what are we doing? Are we lowering cholesterol or reducing cardiovascular risk? So we belly Tom, you know, he, so he had a quadruple bypass, never had a heart attack, and uh, he never went to the doctor much, although he knew he never had high cholesterol. And he um, discovered wheat belly diet and lost 30 pounds. Now when he had this quadruple bypass, the doctor, and I believe appropriately, put him on an aspirin beta blocker and a statin. And so he lost 30 pounds, he wanted to not do the medicine thing. 
And at the time, he stopped his cholesterol medicine. He went on the, um, the wheat belly diet, lost 30 pounds, and his LDL shot up a little bit. But he never really had high cholesterol, yet he had you know, cardiovascular disease. Okay? His, his LDL went up for the first time in his life when he did a wheat belly diet. And he freaked out. And he came to me. He went back on his statin. Dr. Gerber, what am I going to do? And just to make this story short, um, you know, he, uh, let's see, before he took medication, this is a, this is before he took medication. This is actually, I think, after he went on the wheat belly diet and off the medicine, you can see his LDL went up and his ratios got better. So his big thing was his insulin resistance. He has an A1C of 6.6. After 30 pounds, it's 5.8. And this is um, his advanced testing on a statin. This is the only one I had. And statins lower, lower the LDLP. They, they lower the LDLC. They lower the particles, but they don't affect the ratio. And the big thing here is his cardiac myeloproxidase was 480 is normal. It was up at 763, so it was double normal. He has a 50% lesion. So he has a genetic factor where he's a plaque builder. And I told him, I said, Tom, I think we need, to, we need to give you every chance that there is out there. And I think an aspirin beta blocker and a statin is not a bad idea. And that's my official recommendation. And like most of my patients, they say, Dr. Gerber, thank you. I hate taking medication, so I'm not sure what I'm going to do. So we try to work with them. And then just, I'm, I'm done. This is the end of affordable care. Uh, I just love to say in the next 10 years, this chart shows that uh, cost of health care is going to go from $3 trillion to $5 trillion with or without Obamacare. And all these programs just f are funding and subsidizing. So the Bush administration, they funded the um, senior care, and then you know, the, the funds went to the, uh, you know, the affordable care, the Obamacare. And so we just call that shoveling money back and forth. Okay, it's futile. And so you know, it's broken financially and on the, on the medical side, specifically because we're just putting Band-Aids on top of things. We're not addressing root cause, which is diet and nutrition. And so, you know, I'm confident can we repair health care? And so, you know, kind of an initiative to uh, uh, go out to the hospitals or universities and medical schools and try to bring nutrition into it. So the young docs have to uh, understand that there's other ways to address chronic disease than just, you know, with medication, putting Band-Aids band on it. And so this is where Jasmine and I, I think, have a similarity. So in our office, we're trying to redefine the delivery of health care, where we put food and nutrition center stage, where we're trying to address chronic disease, including cardiovascular disease. So thanks.